Perfect. Uh, well, uh, thank you uh, first for having me. I, I, I've spoken at a few past first uh, events and, um, you know, I, I've been in the business for quite a while, but I'm, I've always just um, so humbled to be able to speak with uh, so many great, ama amazing uh, security professionals. I mean, first always seems to attract the most amazing people to their events. And I always feel like I've only been doing this for like a year or something, even though it's been 25 years now. Um, so big thanks to first and, uh, and, and, and thanks to the other speakers for uh, allowing me to be among you. So, uh, so yeah, so we're going to be talking about ransomware. Um, I know it's, uh, you know, there's been a lot in the news lately and, uh, obviously, um, I put together this presentation quite a while ago, um, uh, given, uh, given the, the submission and all that. So it's kind of interesting just given everything that's going on right now with, in ransomware. So. So uh, just a bit about me. Uh, so I am currently the National Cybersecurity Practice Leader for, uh, for Grant Thornton in Canada. I've uh, been in the business for about 25 years. Um, specialized mostly in um, OTICS. I've uh, been doing that for about 10 years, working with uh, power companies and various critical infrastructure and so on. So kind of to, to set the stage, and, and my plan is to talk about a couple, um, a couple cases uh, uh, of some very specific malware, uh, one that I, I worked on as an incident and one that's kind of been in the news and kind of walk through a specific incident. Um, so before we get into that, um, really important to kind of, uh, identify kind of what, 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 where we're at on the ransomware side. So obviously this has become a very popular thing. I mean, we've, we've noticed things like, you know, more ways of paying, um, we're seeing a lot of repurposed uh, malware. So a lot of what I'm seeing in, in the critical infrastructure space is what I refer to as denial and deception. So in a lot of cases, it isn't just about ransomware. There is no actual ransom. It's about basically um, being able to, to uh, incapacitate the victim, right? Um, and then the victim goes through the process of trying to pay the ransom and there is no ransom at the end of the day. Um, ransomware and services is, is on the rise, obviously. Um, more sophistication than just kind of the early forms of ransomware we had when we would have those breaches on personal computers. Um, now they're much, much more complicated, and we're going to see that with the case studies. Um, uh, you know, the unfortunate part of it is there's still a lot of human error involved, so phishing is still a big component of this. Um, vulnerability of victims, uh, again, even with all this ransomware that's occurring, I'm still responding to incidents with clients where they have no vi uh, viable backups. And then we're also seeing this, this concept of double extortion. So, you know, okay, fine, I'm not paying your ransom, I have backups. Uh, well, well, then if you're not gonna pay my ransom, I'm gonna take the data I stole from you and I'm gonna put it up on the dark web or I'm gonna, I'm gonna, release, I'm gonna release it all on the internet. So at the end of the day, you know, attackers are starting to get a little spark because they're seeing that you know, those, those, um, those victims are, are trying to make um, their environments a little bit safer and a little bit uh, uh, better response to ransomware. So why is it so popular? Like a few stats here, 55% small businesses pay the ransom, which is, which is great for the, for the attacker. Uh, 57 times more over, the, over six years by the end of 2021, $20 billion projected costs, um, and as I mentioned, the complexity, ransomware 2.0, um, we're going to see in the case studies, I mean, destroying backups, stealing credentials, uh, that, that um, double, ex double extortion, that publicly exposing victims, um, and so on and so forth. So it's gone beyond just ransomware, where, you know, the breach to get the ransomware to you, there's a lot of effect that comes out of that, and, and not just locking a machine and asking for money. Uh, ransomware attacks every 14 seconds. Uh, it's a pretty astonishing kind of uh, kind of metric there. Uh, just a bit of a view. I mean, um, obviously we're familiar with the um, the Colonial Pipeline. I mean, if if if, if you haven't heard about it, uh, you've probably been on vacation or something. But, uh, but you know, we're we're st starting to see quite a few that are paying the ransom, um, and in many cases, it just it seems like the logical thing to do for them. Um, and it's uh, and it's a lot less pain than trying to uh, resurrect themselves. When people saw things like the 
the Maersk um, uh, hit uh, back in the WannaCry days and the amount of money and effort they spent and the amount of issues they had with their, with their organization. Um, organizations are just saying it's just easier to pay it. And in some cases like Colonial, I mean, they're more worried that get, again, at the end of the day, get, being a critical infrastructure component that they can't let that go too long, right? So into the first, um, into the first uh, case study. So uh, the first one is uh, the, related to the Dharma ransomware. Um, so this is back in, uh, in 2018. Uh, we saw a lot of effects of Dharma and, and I'm, in, I'm in Canada right now. Um, so, you know, for example, Health Sciences in Northern Ontario um, saw a, a breach in late 2018, uh, 24 hospitals affected. They ended up, one hospital was the only hospital that wasn't affected, and they ended up having to move almost all the services there. Now, you got to kind of put yourself in the position, these are regional hospitals. So, you know, if you can't go and get your cancer treatment uh, at the regional hospital, you could be like, three, four hours away from the next hospital. And it just doesn't make sense to have to travel there. Um, this affected them for 72 hours. So on the heels of this breach, I was called in uh, to, to investigate another breach, which I'll talk to you in a second. But looking at Dharma, uh, first appeared in 2016, uh, uh, after master decryption keys for the crisis ransomware were released. Um, it was known to target healthcare providers and it used a number of different uh, extensions uh, on the encrypted files. By 2017 of March, master decryption keys were released. Um, there were specific decryptor tools that were also uh, released to decrypt files. Um, and then in 2018, as we saw with the, the hit in the hospital, in hospitals in Northern Ontario, um, it started to regain speed in 2018 uh, with a lot of new variants being released. And, and what we noticed as well is specifically in Canada, it was a lot of the same, um, when we looked at attribution, it was a lot of the same perpetrator was going after. Um, and we could see that in a lot of the ransom discussions that we were able to kind of link a, a lot of these uh, ransomware attacks to the same person. So it was very interesting. And what we also noticed is that this is where RDP started to become a really big um, um, attack vector for access into these environments. Uh, we also noticed that around this time, a lot of the antivirus engines, the typical antivirus engines of the world, um, were starting to kind of lose speed on being able to detect certain strains of, for example, Dharma in this case. So what we noticed, for example, was in this case, you could see the screenshot from VirusTotal. You know, we noticed a lot of um, a lot of the um, antivirus vendors just weren't picking up this strain. Um, and given uh, at the time, back in 2018, uh, a, lot of these, uh, a lot of these organizations were still relying on uh, kind of uh, first gen um, anti-malware detection tools. Which kind of leads me to our case study. So around 2018, when we were looking at all these hospitals in Ontario, I was, uh, I was called in by a medium sized organization so they were critical infrastructure, well, not critical infrastructure, but industrial control system environment. So they were a manufacturer. The infection for them was widespread. Um, what we noticed was the breach was via RDP and it was a password brute force. Now, unfortunately, the stars weren't aligned with these people. What we did notice is that they had taken an, an existing uh, domain controller and they repurposed it for temporary remote access um, and they put it on the outside in their DMZ. <clears throat> and uh, it was still connected to the existing upgraded AD. Uh, I know that you're all probably saying, oh my God. Well, again, when we came in, we were investigating the ransomware breach and we identified a lot of other crazy things they were doing. Um, so they weren't auditing for failed login attempts. Um, and obviously looking at Windows 2000 Server 2003, they were using a lot of the old school event IDs in the event viewer. So when we when I go through this, you're going to notice a lot of old school events when you when you see them. So the first thing that we noticed, um, and and when we were called in, essentially they had uh, they had put this Windows 2003 server. They unplugged it uh, when they were going through the um, they were going through the uh, response to the ransomware. They unplugged it and they put it in the corner. Uh, because they were trying to get rid of all external access into the environment. And uh, one thing we noticed is the drive was very flaky. It was an older machine. 
Um, and uh, what we were able to recover was an image of the drive. And so we were able to pull a lot of these, uh, a lot of these events off of it. So the first thing we noticed was an event 528. Um, and uh, basically what we noticed is it was a login type of 10, which was RDP. Um, and we noticed there was a successful login uh, of the initial administ administrator account. So based on this, based on the IP address not being anything that they knew, um, we deemed this was the initial uh, brute force into the system using the administrator account. Uh, again, um, they did not have any kind of um, uh, strong password controls or anything. So this was uh, the uh, brute force attack. Right after that, in the timeline, we noticed an event ID 624, which was a user account creation. So the account admin eight was created on the box. Um, and from what we can see, this was obviously um, uh, an, a less obvious account it was created as a backdoor so that the administrator account was, wasn't uh, needed after this. Furthermore, we noticed an event ID 626, um, and that was the setting of the password for the admin eight account uh, for that backdoor account they created. Uh, we also noticed an event ID 636, which was a security enabled local group member added. So essentially the admin eight account was added to the administrators group. So you can see they're setting up a backdoor account and they're get it, getting it the right credentials that it needs. So adding it to the right uh, groups to be able to access the system uh, without using the administrator's account. Uh, right after that, we saw uh, another event ID 528, uh, login type 10. And this is where the backdoor account, the admin eight account was used to log into the system. Um, and then from there, we, we noticed a lot of reconnection. So we noticed a lot of uh, this admin eight account was used to uh, reconnect into the box. And the one thing we noticed was the addresses were various addresses. So obviously we saw some, some sequential stuff. So for example, the 185-220-101 block, we noticed the address uh, as well as the, the client address was uh, different on the other re reconnection attempts. From there, we started to notice, uh, we started to pick up on a lot of things in the timeline here. So one thing we noticed is that um, uh, there was the creation of a bunch of files um, in the local settings temp directory. Um, so for example, um, we noticed that the, the advanced IP scanner was deployed in this machine. Um, and so obviously, you know, this would being the initial attack vector um, the, the beachhead that was set up on this, uh, this Active Directory machine, the next step was to basically start to scan the internal network to look for potential hosts where uh, the ransomware could be deployed to. So Advanced Scanner was deployed on this machine. Um, and uh, obviously this is where they got the information on, as to what the, uh, the topology of the network would have looked like internally for this client. So then the other thing we noticed is a lot of uh, link files uh, that referenced the uh, that were referenced in the antiuser.dat registry hive uh, related to that admin eight account. So some of the things we noticed, for example, were uh, link files called one scan, one mimic, ip.txt, and mimicats.log.lnk. So what we attribute this to is the one scan link would have been a um, um, a link file that was created for the scanning IP scanning tool. Um, our IP.txt would have probably been a list. Um, now, a lot of these files were no longer on the system, but obviously we were able to get this, uh, we were able to still get this information from the registry. Um, the the uh, IP.txt would have been a list of the, the IP addresses they were they were finding. And then obviously they, they were using Mimikatz to uh, harvest uh, password information. Um, so as you can see here, uh, we did find two other files on the desktop of the admin eight uh, user, um, and they were in a directory called OneScan. So the two files we found, and we were able to extract these files from the uh, from the uh, the hard drive image we had. One of them was psexec, and the other one was called svhost, uh, and that's not misspelled. That is misspelled. It is actually sv svhost. So when we looked at those two files, uh, we hashed them obviously um, and went to analyze them. So the first one was uh, PSExec, 
really quick virus total lookup. And obviously that confirmed that that was in fact um, the system terminals PS exec tool uh, legitimately based on the hash. Um, the SV host file obviously was not SVC host. It was not even a renamed version of it. Um, and uh, virus total did detect some, uh, some things that were malicious. So obviously 57 engines out of 75 detected that this was something bad. Um, some other things we noticed as well is um, uh, we noticed some, some different things occurring on the system. Uh, for example, um, anything related to virtual shadow copy. So VS, VSS admin uh, was run and essentially what we noticed is that um, obviously any option where there might've been a shadow copy, uh, the attacker would have gone through and tried to remove those, those shadow copies um, so that there wasn't any running, uh, running backups of the system. Uh, you know, when we, when we looked at, uh, we confirmed that through, uh, through hybrid analysis, um, the static analysis we did of the SV host file. So running it through um, hybrid analysis, we were also able to see that, you know, it was in fact, as we, as we confirmed, uh, deleting any kind of volume shadow copy, uh, volume snapshots um, that, uh, that we saw in the previous static analysis we did. Um, what we'd also noticed is from an uh, attribution perspective, now again, whether this is legitimate or not, um, we did look up some of those IP addresses that we saw uh, when, we, uh, when we did the analysis of the, uh, the EVT files. And we noticed they, they were coming from a few different places. So 37, 187, 129, 166 uh, was, coming from, uh, was coming from France. Um, and um, doing a quick lookup uh, showed that it was a blacklisted IP. Uh, we also noticed that uh, there was another uh, 185.175.208.180, which was um, sourced out of Germany. Now, the interesting thing is a lot of these IPs, when we compared to a lot of the other uh, Intel we had, a lot of the other uh, uh, IOCs we had from other uh, ransomware attacks in in the region during that time frame with Dharma, uh, a lot of these IP addresses were common IPs. So these weren't IPs we were seeing through one campaign. We were seeing these through multiple campaigns involving Dharma. Um, and like I said, a lot of reuse of these IPs, as well as the ransom, uh, the ransom emails, a lot of reuse, for example, of the user, username domains uh, for communication via email. So there was a lot of crossover. And, and the interesting thing was, even though um, a lot of the work we did was with the hospitals and, um, and they were uh, on the healthcare side vertical, uh, this specific case was um, manufacturing, industrial manufacturing, and we saw a lot of commonalities between the two campaigns, which was interesting. Um, further lookup, when we tried to actually hit one of these IP addresses uh, that was uh, in that EVT file, uh, we did notice it was running. Um, it was running an active web server on uh, on port four four three, and uh, what we started to notice was a lot of uh, DGA domains. So we did, you know, with a quick nmap scan, we were able to see that um, that it was basically hosting a web server, um, and that, like I said, a lot of DGA based domains, which was an, an indication of a potential C two server. So. In, interestingly enough, during all of this, even though the attack had happened, the ransom was requested, it looks like a lot of the infrastructure was still uh, still around at the time. The other, the other piece of ransomware I want to talk about is Ryak. This is a little bit more recent. Um, um, and essentially, uh, uh, you know, uh, really began to spread in August of 2018. Um, was uh, behind a third of the ransomware in 2020, 150 million since it first appeared. We, we noticed, obviously, we know there's a lot of different things that came out of the attack framework, a lot of PowerShell used, a lot of lateral movement via RDP, compromise of, of domain controllers, and a lot of use of PS exec for distribution of the binary. Um, so we noticed, for example, a lot of what we saw in, in the work we were doing was the use of Empire, which is... Uh, uh, PowerShell framework for um, uh, for lateral movement. You can see uh, a lot of use of it here. 
Um, this was uh, um, in, very, in very many cases used for privilege es escalation lateral movement. Um, and we saw this quite a bit in the cases we were seeing um, that were using RIAC. What I want to specifically go over is a case study. Now, this is not what was obviously not work we did, but it was an interesting case study and I wanted to bring it to light. So this is the uh, UHS breach 29 hours from the opening of the email to the organ organizational uh, wide shutdown. Uh, ransom was 6 million to decrypt systems, uh, three weeks to be back online, 400 locations impacted. Some of the things that were noticed, initial vector was spear phishing. Um, using a malicious document hosted on a Google uh, Google Docs site. Um, and then basically what happened during this is on the first day, um, the, uh, the actions following the, phishing, the spear phishing attack, um, use of uh, Bizarre, uh, Bizarre as a uh, loader malware, uh, downloaded, ran a document, uh, file called documentpreview.exe, connecting to a CNC machine um, over 443, and then used a process, uh, used a process hollowing technique to inject various processes, including explore.exe and svchost.exe. From there, command.exe was spawn uh, to run a number of command line tools to basically uh, do a bunch of uh, um, uh, information gathering uh, so that they can conduct their lateral movement. So what was noticed was that a bunch of tools were used, things like an NL test. Um, to get domain controller listings. They ran, uh, as well as they ran AB find to do a bunch of recon. Um, so you could, you could basically see it there uh, to be able to grab a bunch of information about the Active Directory, uh, the spread of uh, organizational units, subnets, groups, uh, trust relationships, uh, computers, users, and so on and so forth. So any of this is just to really get that intelligence to spread from a lateral movement perspective. Once they got all that information, they seven zipped it up and they offloaded it uh, through the CNC, uh, um, CNC uh, uh, connection they had established originally. Uh, day two, they also ran uh, Rubius uh, to essentially um, uh, do some further discovery. Um, and uh, that was used, uh, typically it's used to collect uh, Kerberos information from the domain. Um, and it was also at this time that the discovery collection, all that information was exfiltrated via FTP uh, to a server that was identified being hosted in, in Russia. Day two, uh, that's when the lateral movement started. So they used a bunch of remote uh, WMI and remote service execution uh, with PowerShell. Those didn't work very well. So they ended up uh, deploying a Cobalt Strike Beacon uh, that they installed on the host that they had originally set up as their beachhead. Um, and then further on, they started um, transferring executables over SMB uh, around the environment at that point. Uh, further into day two, they deployed more beacons and then they started to do some uh, interesting PowerShell uh, commands. So they used this uh, PowerShell command, which was uh, 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 encoded uh, to, to obviously avoid detection. Uh, decoding that uh, that uh, base 64 encoded uh, uh, piece of their PowerShell command. Uh, you could see essentially they're setting the disable real-time monitoring to true, uh, which essentially disable, disables real-time monitoring of Windows Defender. So essentially they're getting prepped to deploy the ransomware. So they're trying to remove any potential uh, forms of detection on the end, end, end user hosts that, uh, that they're gonna deploy to. So at this point, uh, they also went through and uh, destroyed any, any type of backups that were there to prepare for their first encryption. So you could see a lot of uh, net commands that are used to um, turn off uh, any potential Veeam uh, connections they would have, anything that uh, would possibly uh, um, provide some backups. And then at that point, uh, they started to transfer uh, RIAC uh, it was transferred over to the domain controller and it took only a minute to execute. Um, and then RIAC was essentially transferred to the rest of the hosts of the environment via SMB. Um, and they did that through an RDP connection uh, from the pivot domain, domain controller. So in total, uh, 29 hours from initial execution of Bazaar to uh, domain-wide ransomware. Uh, fairly big organization, 500 hospitals, uh, 90,000 healthcare employees, 3.5 million patients per year. Uh, 
you know, they didn't pay the ransom. Um, and they were quoted as saying that the, uh, uh, the ransomware had an aggregate unfavorable pre-tax impact of approximately 67 million during the year ending December 31st, 2020. So much like other organizations we saw, like the city of Atlanta, for example, or, or even going back as far as Maersk, the Maersk breach, um, not paying the ransom. Now, I'm not saying you should or shouldn't. Uh, that's totally up to you. But obviously, um, not paying uh, can still have a fairly significant uh, um, uh, dollar, dollar attached to it in terms of being able to recover. Just some quick things uh, as we as we close here. Um, uh, you know, obviously this stuff shouldn't be of any news to you, but uh, backups very important. Segregating your networks for your backups, outbound access only. Avoiding file shares for your backups. Um, offsite copies. You know, using products like Veeam or Commvault, and testing those backups. I've done restores. Uh, I've gone to done res do restores during uh, incidents. And we find out the backups are no good or the RPOs are set too low. So the, the data is too old. Uh, network, uh, inventory your assets. Um, you know, when we did this one industrial company, uh, one of the things they didn't have a good understanding was where all their assets were. And they were unsure, we were unsure as to whether or not all the, uh, all of the, uh, the systems would be taken offline to avoid spread of, of the uh, ransomware. Um, avoid RDP hanging out on your on the internet. Uh, obviously, VPN or other forms of secure access should be used. Um, still seeing a lot of single factor authentication. Double that sucker up, put two factor or more. Um, and then segmenting the network, whether it's an industrial network or a regular network, identify what your crown jewels are and, and uh, basically segment them off so you're avoiding um, any kind of flat network. Um, monitoring, another big one. So obviously being able to monitor for things like encoded commands, any kind of weird PowerShell that's going on your network. Um, all of this is, is visible if you're running something like um, Sysmon on your network. Being able to record hashes related to processes and also being able to set up use cases to identify any kind of weird PowerShell um, could have been uh, something where they could have stopped the spread of malware at, at that point. Rely heavily on the attack framework. I find it to be extremely useful. I am forever in the debt of MITRE for, for working on this framework uh, because it provides some really good techniques to be able to detect um, these types of uh, attacks. For example, in the case of RIAC, I mean, they're providing you with all the different uh, techniques that are used. You just have to turn those into monitoring and detection routines. So for example, we know RIAC used command.exe to create a registry entry into an established persistence. Well. You know, if you're running something like Sysmon um, and you're collecting the data into, say, something like Splunk, uh, at the end of the day, you can detect things like PowerShell spawning command.exe. Now, that doesn't mean that you're, you're going to be totally uh, in the clear and that nobody can get, get to you, but it means you'd be able to contain the incident uh, much more earlier um, if you detect something uh, and, and start to take action a lot quicker than, you know, waiting for, in the case of, UHS, there was a lot of pre-work done in the first 12 hours to establish that beachhead, to get files moved around. If you could detect that before they actually kick off uh, the ransomware, then you could be in a position where you never get the ransomware uh, you know, spread on your, on your environment, right? So finally, just in closing, backups, as I mentioned, uh, proper backup process, very important. Uh, be aware, keep your head on a swivel. Uh, you know, first is amazing. Maintain that community of people that, that you can trust and the intel you can rely on to understand what those criminal groups and nation states are doing. Like I said, I've been a big proponent of first. I find what the organization does and what all the members contribute to is amazing. And it's better than almost anything I've seen out there, right? Tabletop exercises. You really have to understand things like I just did one the other day for uh, an organization and they said, well, do we pay the ransom or do we not? Who can make that determination? Where do we get the money? Like they're so focused only on the technical aspect of it, the actual processes to dealing with the ransom, they hadn't thought about that. And it, and it ate into the time to actually make it through the incident. And finally, as I mentioned, using the attack framework, 
um, and building corresponding use cases. So don't just, well, hey, I'm looking for IOCs, focus on those TTPs. You still wanna use the IOCs, get those lists, but really focus on the TTPs because a lot of what these attackers are doing, like the use of encoded PowerShell, the use of uh, Empire, RDP, all these different techniques um, are, are, and behaviors are what are gonna allow you to detect something that's truly abnormal on your environment. And that's all I have. I believe I had 30 minutes and I think, I think I'm within that 30 minutes. Yep, sounds good. Um, I don't know if there's questions right now or afterwards or however we want to do that. Yeah, so thank you, Peter. Um, thank you for the great presentation. I think everybody is worried about ransomware these days, mm -hmm. uh, especially us incident responders. Lots of sound advice there uh, at the end as well. Mm -hmm. um, so for the Q&A, we do it in work adventure. So participants okay. would like to engage with Peter. He, is, uh, he will be, I guess, uh, on... Yep. Uh, on work adventure or in work adventure in, in, a, in a while. Uh, and also he, his contact is there. Uh, reach out to him on, on Twitter as well, if you want to. So yeah, like thanks. One, one last thing, like I, I, I do run a practice. I'm not a sales guy at all. So if anybody wants to contact me, this is my personal information. Uh, more than happy to answer any other questions to provide more details in some of these campaigns we've, we've worked through. Um, and then pretty active on Twitter. So uh, don't feel like if you contact me, I'm going to try to sell you anything. I'm not a sales guy. <laughs> All right. So that's, that's good to hear. So thank you, Peter. Thank, thank you. you.